uh, it could be either, right? Mm -hmm. um, but at the at the same time, whether it's all on specific people that actually lived or not, it's the message he's commuting, communicating in the parable and done in a way that non-believers and or the fair, hardened Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes may not be able to understand it because they're blocking their own uh, insights onto mm -hmm. it. So uh, it's it, it, with a parable, you always have to focus on, for me, you always have to focus on the meaning of the parable, which he provides every yep. time. So uh, again, um, I, I caution people to, to, you know, especially with Abraham's bosom, to think that there is a place like perdition or something like that or you know we're, we're especially in the catholic religion where they think there's a place where you go that mm -hmm. uh, purgatory is what they call i'm sorry not perdition. yeah um so and we don't get that biblically so yeah mm -hmm. just uh, you know what there's great information in the details of the parables because uh, it would provide you additional information mm -hmm. of maybe what sheol actually looks like again the parable was always designed to resonate with the people that were listening to it at the time and people of the nation if they wanted to learn about it so it wasn't going to be in a way that uh, that's just a fairy tale name it was there to 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 try and get people to open their eyes but it, you can't force them to so exactly people have to want to understand it yeah it's not only um you know what they could physically do it was also the knowledge that they had and the technology they could create so you have sort of a trifecta of things so first thing for people to sort of get their heads around this is that you have to understand that they have had the ability to create a physical presence of their choice on the mm -hmm. earth and so i think in most times they would take a presence that would reflect their a their angel presence as a spirit being but obviously as a spirit being there would be some sort of form or vision or holographic type image of who and what they would look like because we get descriptions of angels in the bible right so seraphim mm -hmm. are serpent faced angels with six wings so there's that opalescence aspect but it's and in that spirit spirit sense but there's a form that that spirit energy takes and you have like the cherubim that have four faces they have a face of an ox or a bull they have a face of an eagle they have a face of a lion and a face of a human being. And an Ophanim would have three faces of one of those four, uh, which we're not told which they are. But he also has a face of a trubum, whichever one was depicted <laughs> <laughs> from that of a trubum Jeez. that an Ophanim was. And if people aren't familiar with what an Ophanim is, that word comes up in the book of Enoch as one of the four groups of watchers. We get that biblically, but we don't get it presented to us as Ophanim because our churches aren't really helpful to us in terms of understanding the original Hebrew and the original Greek to sort out the angelic realm. So mm -hmm. in Ezekiel 1, 3, and 10, we get these the throne of God image that Ezekiel has in the vision. And, you know, we have the cherubim, which is fine, but then you have these wheels within wheels and the mm -hmm. wheel aspect, when it says specifically wheel, it goes back to the Hebrew word Gilgal for wheel, uh, as in, um, you know, a wheel on a chariot, or uh, I really like this comparison as an example is Gilgal Raphaim, which is <laughs> wheel of the giants at the foot of Mount Hermon. It's an old <laughs> worship site of, oh, uh, boy. of the Raphaim and Canaanites. <laughs> Um, and there's this being that is within the wheels. And that goes back to the word Ophan, which means wheel as well. And we understand it as it's translated into the book of Enoch as Ophanim, which is the male plural. So these are the wheel angels, just as the seraphim are the serpent ones, right? Uh, oh, man. So on and so forth. So. Yeah, so those are the angels that we kind of get descriptions of. Archangels seem to have a face of a human as well. But then there are 
other orders that we're not really told about what mm. they might look like. Uh, they have descriptions of them in other um, religions like Gnosticism. So, but, you know, we have like, again, I'll, I'll use some of the um, Greek words that they come up in the New Testament as opposed to what they may necessarily come as because the translators takes the same word and they might translate it two or three different ways. And then they might confuse two, like for powers, for example, they mm -hmm. conflate that one and it's talking in about two different kinds of angels when it's mentioning a power. They just decided to translate it that way. Maybe they didn't understand or maybe it was designed <laughs> to confuse people. I'll mm -hmm. let people make their own decision on that. But yeah. so like you have the, the Dunamis uh, and you have the, the Icarus and you have the Excusia and you have the Arches and the Archons and you have all of these different types of angels. I won't go through them all, but they have their own rebellious order this own hierarchy, their own army, but we're not really given the descriptions of these other ones. And so they'll show up for people that I'm referring to some of these words as the mighties or as the um, powers or the principalities, uh, the rulers, the lordships, and they all go back to, it's consistent in Greek. It's just not consistent <laughs> in English. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, until I could not crack how it might look until I got to the original language. And, mm. and from that, you can you kind of establish the, uh, a proper order and hierarchy based on the names that were provided. But we're not told on how they look, but there's an interesting uh, outside book. Um, <laughs> it's called the uh, Pistis Sophia. Uh, Sophia, I'm sorry. And uh, so they've got these archons from before the flood. And they're kind of in two different groups. Uh, one are multi-headed, oh, similar to a cherubim, and some are single-headed. Uh, they kind of repeat a little bit. And they give their names and everything. Like, you know, for example, it's got in the third dungeon of the abyss, you have Arkarok. I'm reading this because I can't, I can remember a lot, but uh, <laughs> this gets down to a level of detail uh, I'm not all that good with. And at a dog's <laughs> fate. And you have a ruler in the fourth dungeon with a serpent's face, and his name is, you know, Ak Akrakar. You've got a cat face. You've got a crocodile face. Um, you've got a basilisk face, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> and then you have all these similar ones. You have a wild boar's face. You have a bear's face. They have all of these different kinds of faces. And then you have the multi-headed ones, um, that have seven, basically seven heads, like, uh, you know, some depictions in polytheism of, of hydras, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and just as Leviathan has multiple heads, as it's described in the Bible.